Hey guys, today I have a really special, well, you know what? I say that every time. Today I have a really special, but today I really have a special video for you. In fact, I already teased you about it. Remember when we celebrated 50,000 subscribers? Today we will hit 50,000 subscribers. Oh my God! Oh my God! And that was the teaser to this gun. Now, I'm finally ready to do this story. Um, and actually, it is a gun and a story wrapped up in one. Now, I know you guys get the shakes if I don't show you a gun within the first two minutes of a video. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this gun. And uh, then I will show you the gun. And then I'll tell you the story behind it. Instead of being a World War II story, this is actually a gangster story. So to start off, this gun was purchased by Charles Urschel. Uh, he was an Oklahoma oil man. Uh, from the, back in the 30s. Uh, he was actually the wealthiest man in Oklahoma. Uh, the gangster was Machine Gun Kelly. Now, the trial of Machine Gun Kelly, uh, because of this kidnapping, and this gun itself, they have a number of firsts. First, the trial. The trial of Machine Gun Kelly for the kidnapping of Charles Urschel was the first time they used the Charles Lindbergh Law. Charles Lindbergh, you know, uh, his child was kidnapped, his baby was kidnapped, and uh, eventually the baby was killed. Um, and right after that, the government, the federal government, made kidnapping a federal crime and punishable by death. So it meant as soon as Charles Urschel was kidnapped, uh, they invoked the Lindbergh law and the FBI got involved. J. Edgar Hoover was involved, and he assigned one of his crack detectives to handle the case. The second first is uh, this was the first trial where they allowed filming of the, uh, of the courtroom. It was like the crime of the century. This would be like the O.J. Simpson trial, except in Oklahoma, it was such a big deal. Oklahoma City was just filled with reporters and people coming in to watch this trial, and they allowed filming in this trial for the first time. And the third first on this um, particular trial was when Machine Gun Kelly was finally caught. Spoiler alert, he was caught. Machine Gun Kelly, uh, when he came out, he said, don't shoot, G-Men. And that was the first time, he was the first one to use the term G-Men, and the name stuck. They even made a movie called G-Men. Okay, we're going to say a little bit more about the uh, trial, uh, the arrest, and it's actually a fascinating story. It, uh, it sounds like a Hollywood movie, and you know what? This video might go up for an Emmy. We'll wait and see. But I'm going to tell you the story of the trial after I show you the gun, because I know you guys get the shakes. So, here we are. Um, here's three first on this gun. First, as you're looking at this finish, you see that it is verkrompt. That's a German word for a satin nickel finish. Now, I've done videos before on engraved guns, and you've seen gold engraved guns, you've seen chrome engraved guns, silver engraved, blue engraved. I have never seen a verkrompt engraved. Charles Urschel ordered three. So these were special orders. They were all the same as far as I know. I know where two of them are, this one and one other, but there were three ordered all at the same time by Charles Urschel to give to his friends as a thank you. Um, actually, they were uh, people who helped him through the trial, uh, through the arrest, and actually uh, they helped him through the kidnapping, and I'll tell that story in a minute. The second first is the fact that this is new in the box, meaning it comes with the original box. Now, I, again, I've, uh, I've seen them come in this, uh, this brown presentation case, and this one is in like new condition, but it also comes with the original box, and that was a first for me as well. The third first, as we, again, look at the engraving, this is the first time I've ever seen what I would call this style of uh, engraving. I call it an English scroll. I have read uh, other people have called it an English scroll. But if you look at it, uh, first of all, let's look at the left side of the gun. It almost looks like seashells, like a little swirl to it. But also in the middle, there's kind of a floral look. Um, and you can see that there is black wax pencil in the markings. Do not remove that because in this case, that is original. They actually did that in the factory. That black uh, stenciling uh, was done in the factory. You see made in Germany, so it was made for export. Of course, we know uh, it was going to the United States, ordered by a very wealthy oil man. Um, you can see the uh, ivory grips. If we look at the other side, you can see the ejection port is not 
engraved, and I've seen about half and half. Half the time they are, half the time they are not. Um, but again, you see the English scroll. Uh, notice the blued rear sight, and that's the way they did the Vikram guns. You also see the serial number has the black wax pencil in it. On the bottom, you can see the button is engraved and the bottom of the magazine is engraved. You pull the magazine out and you can see that the magazine is completely Vikram finish. If you look at the front strap, they almost look like a shell. Um, again, I describe it as a shell, but it's like an English scroll and the same way with the back with a little bit of a floral pattern. But probably the most important part on the bottom of the gun, and again, usually in, uh, the Germans would put their name on the front strap or right on the, uh, the slide. But in this case, uh, Charles Urschel, um, for his three friends, he put the initials on the bottom of the gun. You can see it is JGC, which stands for John G. Catlett. Um, there is another one that is made out to E.E. E. Kirkpatrick. Um, these two men were the mediators between the kidnappers and the Urschel family. So um, let me get into the story in a little bit more detail. But again, this gun was a gift from Charles Urschel to John G. Catlett. Just before I move on, if I look at the serial number and I look it up in my database, this gun was made in 1933, but probably engraved afterwards. So in other words, um, they made the gun, uh, it was unfinished, unhardened, uh, the serial number was applied, and then the order came in because this was made in 33. The kidnapping happened in July of 1933. Uh, the trial was late 33, early 34, and when it was all over, he ordered these. Um, they, they engraved them specially for him. Again, three PPs all look about the same as this one. Uh, probably <laughs> this has got to be the nicest one because I don't think it could be improved upon brand new condition, but all of them had the ivory grips and fully engraved for crumped. Um, so that would take a, at least uh, six months to fill the order. So probably these were presented to his friends in late 1934. Uh, before I move on, we should probably take a, uh, a closer look at the case again. Um, I would, I would think this was repro if I didn't know better. It's not. This is all original, just like the gun. The leather-like exterior is, uh, there's uh, hardly a mark on it anywhere, and most of the ones I see are a little bit tattered. Um, the hinges all work great, and then the green interior is just beautiful. You can see there is a space for a cleaning rod. This did not come with one. I could easily put one in there. And there's also space for three dummy rounds, and I actually have original dummy rounds, so maybe I'll throw those in to a lucky buyer. Uh, I've already shown you it comes with a matching box, and of course that has the early tin with the factory logo on it. And of course, I just said the, uh, uh, the cleaning rod was missing, but here it is in the original box. So it comes with the cleaning rod and the tin. Um, and I do have the three dummy rounds here, so I'll just put these all together. Okay, now it's story time. It was a hot, muggy Oklahoma day in July of 1933. You know why I know that? Because every night in July in Oklahoma is hot and muggy. So um, it was actually the Urschels, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Urschel, uh, were playing bridge with their neighbors. Uh, the Jarrett's. Um, they, were, they were good friends and often got together. They're out on the screened-in back porch. Um, that's actually recorded in this book, which is, this book was written in 1934, and look who the author is, Kirkpatrick. He was one of the ones that uh, got a gun as well, um, and he wrote a book immediate, uh, immediately thereafter, and he goes into great detail about what happened um, and it was fresh on his mind because he wrote the book uh, within a year of the kidnapping. So they're playing bridge out on the back porch and two men come up. Uh, they, they didn't know who they were. They just came up to the door. Um, they said, uh, we want Charles Urschel. Neither one of them I, I answered them. So they took both men. So it was Mr. Jarrett and Mr. Urschel. They threw them in the back of the car. Now they walked up with a pistol. Uh, according to the uh, eyewitnesses who later recalled, um, the one man had a Thompson and the other guy had a pistol. So when they say get in the car and you're carrying a Thompson, it looks like this. 
uh, you get in the car. And so that's what they did. Both men got in the car. Um, they drove about nine miles outside of the town, again, Oklahoma City. They were headed south, and they then questioned both men. They got their driver's licenses, and Mr. Jarrett had 50 bucks. They took it um, and threw him out of the car, and they kept uh, Mr. Urschel. Now, um, what they did with Mr. Urschel, they, they blindfolded him and put him on the floor of the back seat. And he must have been an incredibly smart man because uh, the things that he did in this moment of pure terror. Um, well, I just have to, like I said, this is like a Hollywood movie. So they put him in the back of the car. He remembers when he went over uh, railroad tracks. So he knew in his mind what road they were on. And then he uh, went through oil fields because he was, an oil, he was an oil man and he could hear the rigs going, you know, the up and down of the rigs. He could hear it and he could smell it. So he knew the direction they were going. Um, they drove for a couple of hours. They got out and he said it was in an oil field because he could hear the uh, machinery going. They switched cars and he said it was, uh, it was a Cadillac and he names the brand. Uh, he kept track of that. Uh, then they drove all night long south um, and uh, he didn't know it, but he ended up in Paradise, Texas, uh, just, just below Oklahoma. They kept them there for nine days and they released them because the ransom was paid. Now, while he was in captivity, he could hear a plane coming at some hour. It was like nine o'clock in the morning. He could hear a plane go by, going one direction. And then later in the day, he could hear a plane going in another direction. And he kept track of the time of when the planes went over. And it happened every day around the same time. He also kept track all nine days of what the weather was. Um, in that area, like when it rained, he, could, uh, he knew that he would be able to tell the police. And the other thing that he did is he touched everything he possibly could in the house to leave his fingerprints everywhere so the police could figure out once they had these guys, they'd have all the evidence they needed. Now, while he's being held captive for nine days, um, they ask him, uh, who do you trust most in the world, um, you know, in terms of not going to the police, uh, people who care about you, who we can trust to carry, uh, to come through on the ransom money. And he gave them two names, uh, Kirkpatrick and John G. Catlett. For two days after the kidnapping, nobody heard anything. Um, finally, they got a package from Western Union. They don't do that anymore. Today it's FedEx. But Western Union delivered a package and it had a ransom note in it. There's actually a copy of the ransom note in the book and basically they asked for $200,000 in cash, unmarked bills in 20s. Now today it would be $2 million in hundreds, but um, back then it was $200,000 to get uh, Mr. Urschel back alive. They were of course told not to go to the police and they did. And the police immediately informed the FBI, remember the uh, Lindbergh kidnapping law, uh, they uh, contacted the FBI, and the FBI sent in their, their best man. And you can see him right here. This is Gus Jones. Now, he reported directly to J. Edgar Hoover, but he was the man that was sent in to um, solve the kidnapping of Charles Urschel. So John Catlett and Kirkpatrick, got to get these names right, um, they gathered the money together and they uh, agreed to meet with the kidnappers and do the drop, which they did. Everything went smoothly. And so, uh, again, nine days later, they released um, Urschel. Now, they found out later that he was in a hideaway for Machine Gun Kelly and his wife, Catherine Kelly. Um, Urschel later said that he thought that Catherine Kelly was the brains behind the operation, but Machine Gun Kelly and a couple other men, actually, at the end of the trial, 21 people were actually convicted of kidnapping and or aiding and abetting because um, the people in Texas, they had a hideaway and the relatives and the family, they all kept their mouth shut. Nobody turned him in. He was a uh, bootlegger, a bootlegger, baby. I'm a bootlegger. <laughs> what? Bootlegger the movie, baby. He was a bootlegger and he was a um, bank robber. And of course, back in the 1930s, uh, during the Depression, uh, there was a lot of people who saw them as heroes. But nonetheless, this was the biggest uh, caper that Machine Gun Kelly ever tried to pull off. So they get the ransom money and of course they think they're safe because they're in the middle of nowhere. I, uh, no offense to anybody who lives in Paradise, Texas, but back in the 30s you were in the middle of nowhere. 
Um, but of course, uh, when Urschel talked to the FBI, he gave them the exact times of when the planes came over, when it rained. And from that information, it was actually American Airlines, which still flies out of uh, Dallas, Texas. I'm going to be there tomorrow on a flight out west. Um, but American Airlines was operating. They had the, the schedule of the planes and they knew this is where the plane uh, crosses at that time, and this is where the other plane, they got X marks to spot, and they were able to go right to the farmhouse, more like a shed, um, and they arrested the Kellys, and that's when Machine Gun Kelly came out. Don't shoot, G-Man. So that's how it all went down, and uh, Machine Gun Kelly and Catherine Kelly were arrested, again, along with 21 other people that the FBI was able to round up. So the trial of Machine Gun Kelly and his crew, it happened almost immediately, not like today. It would be, you know, it'd be uh, waiting to be tried for at least a year, but they tried him almost immediately. He was convicted. Um, most of the male members of the gang, of the Machine Gun Kelly gang, most of the male members were given life in prison. Uh, there were some wives and significant others, as we call them, uh, that were with them. Most of the women got about 20 years. Uh, Catherine Kelly got 20 years. Machine Gun Kelly was first sent to Leavenworth uh, because they felt like there was a risk of somebody trying to break him out. And then later he was sent to Alcatraz. Uh, Catherine Kelly went to Alcatraz. She served 20 years. Um, and so she did uh, come out and uh, died in the late 50s. Machine Gun Kelly uh, died in prison in the 50s. One postscript to this story, which I found very interesting. In fact, um, I have a letter here. Uh, this is actually written by Kent Freights. And he is an attorney, and he writes this letter about the three guns that were given out. And it also says my, my grandfather, by marriage, uh, was Joseph Anthony Freights, and he got one of these guns too. So uh, Joseph Freights was friends and helpful to the Kellys. He actually gives the serial number of the gun. Um, and then he says that Mr. Uh, Mr. Urschel was a very kind and generous man with consistent character. And that's the, the postscript I, I wanted to do, um, because uh, in the book, after his death, after Mr. Urschel died, they learned that Pauline Kelly, the daughter of uh, Machine Gun Kelly and Catherine Kelly, their daughter got free education because somebody made an anonymous donation to a college for her to attend for free. Nobody knew who that person was, but after, after he died, they revealed the fact that uh, Charles Urschel paid for her education. So are you having the shakes again? Cause I'm gonna pull out the gun. I wanna wrap up with this gun. Now I've mentioned before that my good friend, Peter Hisher passed away um, of just a few months ago and that's, I'm going out to the house tomorrow. This was one of his prized possessions and we are helping, Legacy Collectibles is helping to settle the estate. Uh, this will be um, offered for sale price upon request. Um, it is an expensive gun, but again, this is the prize of his collection. Uh, and they gave us the honor of showing it to all of you. Um, uh, probably all of you would want to own this. I would. Um, but uh, in fairness uh, to the family, we obviously want to get the best possible price. So if, uh, if you're interested, you need to contact us by email and we can discuss it. Um, but um, again, there's only three of these that are known. I know where one is and we have one. And um, there's another one with the Freights family, I believe. Um, they probably still have it. Hey, thanks for watching. I really enjoyed and I was excited about showing you the, this gun, but uh, the whole reason for us having it uh, just makes me a little bit more somber as I think about, um, you know, people who have lost their lives due to COVID during this past year. It's been difficult, but it's a real honor to help the family out and by helping to settle their estate. And I have a lot more that we're going to be bringing from Peter's collection. So you want to make sure you continue to watch our videos because there's a lot more coming your way when I get back from my trip.